Hello everyone, welcome along to our webinar today and um, thank you for taking time out of your busy weekend to join us. Um, as you know, today we are going to talk about teaching online. So I am sure that you will all have lots of questions for us on this topic. Um, it tends to be one of our most popular topics, especially with new teachers who are just entering the industry. Um, so before we start that though, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Mairead, it rhymes with parade, and I am based in the west of Ireland. Um, I've been in the TEFL industry now for over 20 years, and yeah, what an exciting 20 years they have been. <laughs> um, some of that teaching has been done online, so hopefully I'll have lots of experience and lots of stories to share with you in this session. Um, as always, there will be a questions and answers session after our presentation. So please write down any questions that you have while I'm going through the presentation. Um, you can type them in the chat box as we go, or you can save them till the end. It's up to you. All right. So if we are ready, let's go, because we have plenty to say about this. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to look at some main things. Um, we're going to look at why you ought to be interested in teaching English online, how to do it. Um, we're going to give you some key considerations to think about. And we're also going to give you some top tips for when you start teaching for real. And yes, the Q&A session as aforementioned. So let's jump straight in with why teach English online. Well, as I'm sure you are all aware, it is a massive industry. OK, um, there has been a dramatic increase in online learning, um, especially since COVID. Remember that? <laughs> it seems like a long time ago now. But since 2020, um, learning English online has skyrocketed. Um, there was an estimate in 2021 that the English language online learning market was worth over 8.4 billion euro. And I'm sure that has only increased over the last three or four years. Um, so the demand is there. Also, teaching online appeals to so many people due to its flexible living and working arrangement. <laughs> um, you know, you can tailor your teaching online timetable to suit your lifestyle. Um, you know, it is the ultimate in work-life balance. Um, it also allows you to be a digital nomad. Um, in other words, if you're teaching online, you can work from anywhere. Like a lot of people work from home, where they're from, but equally, there are a lot of teachers who travel the world and work as they go. Um, the beauty of it being that all they need is their laptop and an internet connection. Okay, they don't need anything else. So you can theoretically travel and work at the same time so many advantages to it. Um, so let's look at how then, how you might get involved in teaching online. Well, you have two main options. You can either work for a company or you can be independent. And each of those options comes with their own pros and cons, as with everything in life. Um, so let's look first at how you might get involved in teaching with a company. Um, so as I'm sure you know, if you've done any level of research, there are hundreds of online schools out there. Um, for example, EF or Wales English or Bling ABC. Um, there are so many companies out there. Um, you will find that you have to do a lot of research. Like if you find the name of a an online school that looks interesting to you, Google them, look at their website, read their reviews, find out what other teachers are saying about them. Um, it's always really, really important to do your research. Um, you will find that when you apply to online schools, um, there is an incredibly high probability that they will have entry requirements. Yeah, such as they will want you to do an intro video or they might want you to do a demo lesson. We have covered these topics in another webinar in, I think it was a couple of months ago. So 
If you want to know more about intro videos and demo lessons, please head along to our YouTube channel and check out our webinar on that very topic. Um, so the idea is that you do your intro video and your demo lesson. The school decides if they want to hire you or not. And if they do hire you, hopefully, um, students will then book lessons with you or the school will assign you to different groups. Um, so it could go one of two ways. Either you would find that you're teaching different groups every time, or you will find that you might be assigned to specific groups and you will see only them. And so it very much depends on the school and how they operate. But basically, if you work for an online school, they will find the students for you. Um, another very common thing with online schools is that student feedback is really important to them. Um, after every class, your students will be asked to give feedback on it on the lesson. And the good thing is that you can get lots of bonuses, like monetary bonuses, depending on how positive your feedback is. Um, Online schools tend to offer bonuses for pretty much everything, like for positive feedback, for punctuality, for, you know, any number of things. So when you do start working for your online school, make sure you are aware of their bonus system. Yeah, make sure you know all of the ins and outs um, so that you are getting paid everything you are entitled to. Um, so that is a brief rundown of working for a company. Okay. Once they hire you, they find you the students. Okay. On the other hand, you might choose to be independent. Okay. Um, you might think, mm, I really don't want to be tied down to a specific company. Yeah. I would prefer to find my own students and make my own way, <laughs> set my own timetable. Um, so there are so many advantages to being um, an independent, a freelancer. Okay, but there are also some drawbacks depending on how you view it. Um, so if you are independent, you are responsible for everything. Okay, you need to do your own marketing. So put yourself out there on LinkedIn, maybe on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, it's all up to you to get your own name out there. Um, you may also find that the most beneficial thing is to set up your own website. Um, again, it's something that can incur some costs in setup, but you know it is worth it in the long run if that's the route you want to do. Um, as I said, social media can be big here, so you know get yourself out there. <laughs> Lots of um, self publicity, explaining to everybody what you do and what you offer. Um, it takes a lot of time, I find, to get established when you work as an independent. Um, but again, like anything, the more effort you put in, the more likely you are to succeed. Um, there are also lots of platforms out there for independent teachers. For example, Preply, Twinix, etc. You would sign up for them, create your profile, and students can come and find you on these platforms. Um, now, it seems like a lot of work compared to working for a school, right? But the beauty of being independent is that you set your own pay rates and your schedule, okay? Um, so you can charge considerably higher per hour than you might perhaps earn at an online school. Um, it's up to you what route you want to go down. Um, being independent also means that you have to do all of the admin, like you have to prepare your invoices, you need to pay your taxes, all of the regular things you do as a self-employed business person. Um, because if you are working as an independent, that is what you are, okay? You are um, a business person, you're running your own empire. <laughs> um, so. There are many advantages and disadvantages, I think, attached to both working for a school and being independent. Ultimately, it depends on what best suits your life circumstances. Um, I know a lot of teachers, when they start out, they prefer to spend a year or two working for a school, an online school, 
Um, because then, you know, they can just focus on the teaching. They don't have to worry about finding students. They don't have to worry about marketing. Um, they can just focus on the teaching. Um, so a lot of students, a lot of teachers will start working for a school. And then when they're confident teachers, um, they will branch out and be independent. Um, however, I also know teachers who have gone straight into being independent and they are loving life. So again, totally depends what you want. Yeah, and how you want to work. So there is no right or wrong. Do whatever suits you. So other things to think about when embarking on a career as, a, as an online teacher could be time zones. So um, when you're teaching online, of course, your students can be from anywhere all over the world. So that in mind if you are teaching for example um, students in Japan but you are in Ireland um, there is a 10 hour time zone gap there right like Japan is 10 hours ahead of Ireland so you may not necessarily um, be able to teach your nine to five if it doesn't correspond to the students you are targeting okay um, so for example if you wanted to get the Japanese daytime market the likelihood is that you would be working in your nighttime and you know that's perfectly fine if that's what you want okay but just be aware that time zones um, may not always be compatible with the hours that you want to work because it all depends on the students and their availability um, so be prepared to be flexible and know that you may not necessarily be doing a nine to five in your time zone Okay, you may need to be flexible with the hours you work. Um, if you plan to be one of those teachers who is traveling and working at the same time, um, be conscious of visas and documentation. Okay, like if your plan is to travel around Asia and work, you know, just make sure that you have the right visa in place to allow you to do that. Or if you're constantly changing countries, you know, make sure you have checked out the logistics of that. Um, cost of living is another thing to bear in mind. Um, if you are living in a rather expensive country, um, for example, my country, Ireland, very, very expensive, um, make sure that you are making enough money <laughs> um, to make it a viable possibility for you. Um, even if you're, if you're traveling and working at the same time, yeah, make sure that you are always earning enough to cover your costs. Um, you know, I'm sure you would do that anyway, but bear it in mind. Take into account cost of living and if you're making enough to make ends meet. Um, again, if you're going to be traveling and working at the same time, be careful not to have too much stuff with you. Because if you're constantly changing countries, it can be a lot like packing up your stuff moving along packing again moving along so try to embrace minimalism as best you can and make sure that you have like good ways to transport your laptop all of your tech because you know that is how you earn your living <laughs> so always um, have a plan for getting your laptop around with you safely um, have everything backed up um, you know just cover your bases when it comes to keeping your technology safe. Connectivity is another thing. Um, you know, some countries and some areas of countries can have better internet than others. And if you are planning to travel and teach as you go, make sure that you always plan ahead and you always know where you are going to connect to the internet before you go there. Um, you know, you'll do a lot of asking about Wi-Fi and you'll be doing a lot of speed tests for your laptop. Um, so yeah, plan ahead, make sure you have strong internet access wherever you go because you can't work without it. Um, another thing you need to bear in mind, um, both if you're teaching from home or if you're traveling and teaching, um, make sure you have access to quiet places. Um, a lot of new teachers think, oh, I'll just get a table at a cafe and just stay there for the day and it'll be fine. Well, maybe it won't because 
cafes tend to be super noisy. They tend to be busy. You tend to have random music and shouting in the background. Um, so, you know, think about this again in advance before you go somewhere new. Find a quiet place to work from. Um, maybe it's a hotel room. Yeah, maybe you can book a room in a library. Yeah, maybe you rent your own Airbnb so there's no problem. You stay there or your hotel room. But yeah, think ahead and make sure you have a quiet place to work. The same if you work from home. Um, if you have any pets, if your neighbors decide to do some DIY, um, if you have a delivery and your doorbell starts going during your class, how are you going to cope with that? Okay, just think about how you're going to make your environment as quiet as possible. Um, so there are some obvious things that you need to think about, yeah, such as the time zones and the quiet place, but Hopefully I've given you some food for thought on other things to take into account. Okay, let's move on then to some tips to help you as you teach English online. So if you decide to go down the route of working for an online school, you have nothing to worry about because they will give you access to their platform. Yeah, and you will work from their virtual school. Okay, they will give you training on how to operate it, etc. Um, however, if you decide to go down the independent route, um, you will need to choose a platform and tools okay, that will help you with your online teaching. Um, so there are loads of platforms you can choose if you are going down the independent route. Um, you can use um, Google Meet, you can use Zoom, okay, you can use Skype. That is still a thing in some parts of the world. Um, you can use the Microsoft uh, meeting space. You know, there are tons of options. Um, if you want a more professional look, you can use something like Google Classroom. You can use Canvas, Blackboard. Um, these are all what we call LMSs, okay? Learner management systems where you can log in and have like a virtual classroom space. Um, so, you know, if you're going down the independent route, check them out, see which one you like best. Um, some of them are free. Um, some of them are free for a limited time. For example, with Zoom, you have 40 minutes, 40 minute sessions. Um, if you want longer, you need to go premium. Um, but, you know, check that out and decide which platform makes the most sense for you. Um, personally, I like Zoom. I think it's the easiest one to use. Um, it's not super expensive if you want a subscription and it's very easy to set up meetings and notify your students and get them links. Um, so personally, I'm a Zoom fan. But as I said, research, choose whichever one suits you best. Um, Microsoft Teams is also quite user friendly, I find. Um, so once you have decided what platform you're doing, um, you can then check out some tools that you can use in your virtual classroom. Um, for example, Kahoot is a really fun quiz-based app. You can use it to set quizzes for your students and to do really fun interactive activities. Um, Quizlet is similar, interactive flashcards, you can make games. Um, Padlet is a really fun app. Um, if you've never used it before, it's basically a virtual notice board. Um, so you could set up a Padlet for your class. Um, your students can click into it and they can see tons of activities. You can put listenings, you can put images, visuals. Your students can make comments. Um, Padlet is really fun. And it's a great way to, um, you know, to bring your class together and to add some variety to your virtual environment. Um, so yeah, again, research, find the things that work for you and use them. Um, don't feel like you need to use all of the tools, <laughs> okay? We don't want our students to be so distracted by all these apps that they lose focus, but you know, use them as needed and they can be great for adding some interaction and some entertainment to your classes. Um, 
setting up your teaching environment is also incredibly important. Um, make sure that your laptop and your PC or PC are kept in like good condition. Make sure you update them regularly. Like they are essentially your whole working life. <laughs> okay. If you don't have your laptop, you can't work. Or if you don't have your PC, you can't work. So keep them in tip top condition as much as you can. And, you know, if you can afford to consider upgrading to faster, um, more reliable ones. Um, especially if you're traveling while teaching, you know, that can take its toll, like your laptops, your laptop might get a bit banged up. Um, it might get dropped, it might get, you know, banged off train seats. <laughs> so just mind your tech, okay? That is your workplace. So mind it and be careful with it. Um, again, make sure you have fast internet connection. Okay, do whatever you can to ensure the stability of your network connection. Um, consider upgrading to fiber internet if you can. Um, if you're traveling and teaching, make sure you have planned in advance where you are going to connect to the internet. Um, consider getting a webcam and a headset. Make sure you have a comfortable chair, especially when you're working from home, like you will be sitting in your chair for hours at a time. So make sure it's comfortable. You don't want to end up with a back problem or a neck or a shoulder problem at the end of it. Um, if you do think that you're going to be um, teaching online for a consider considerable length of time, it's going to be like your full-time career, um, consider investing in some really good office equipment, like a proper office chair, maybe a footrest, maybe armrests, yeah, maybe a laptop stand. Um, you know, it's worth the investment to get these things when you can, if teaching online is going to be your full-time career. Um, try to have a professional background. Um, you know, try to find a nice blank wall or something with a nice plant and picture in the background. Nothing too busy, nothing too distracting, okay? Um, so yeah, try to keep the background appropriate. Make sure there's nothing in the background that students shouldn't see. Um, for example, your personal photographs, if you don't want to share that, um, you know, consider what your students can see and what you want them to see or don't want them to see. Um, also, make sure you have your, your lesson plan, your notes, your teaching materials on your desk with you. Um, try to have a nice spacious desk if you can, to have all of your stuff around you so that you don't need to leave um, your laptop in order to get what you need, okay? Set up your desk just as you would in any working environment. Okay, another thing that we need to be very, very conscious of, especially these days, is privacy and safety online. Um, so I'm sure you have all heard of GDPR, um, the importance of keeping your and your students' personal data private. Um, again, this need not be such a big deal if you're working in an online school. Yeah, they will take care of all of that for you. But if you're giving like private one-to-one -one lessons or if you're working as an independent, um, make sure that you keep your students and your personal data private. Okay, find a way to manage it. Um, for example, you don't want, you know, to be sending out emails with everybody's email address on them. Yeah, because then they all have access to each other's email, they can see each other's data, and you know, that's not ideal. So just be conscious of those things of keeping everybody's data private. Um, when it comes to sharing photos and videos, you know, do not record your students without their consent. Do not publish photos of your students. You know, use common sense here. And again, brush up on your knowledge of GDPR. Okay, data protection. Um, unfortunately, bullying and unsuitable behavior like that are rife, especially with young learners and perhaps teenage learners. So again, be conscious of not giving out um, information 
two other students, um, you know, don't ask for them to put their mobile numbers in chat, for example. Um, always be aware of keeping everybody's information as private as you can. And don't share any data, don't record, don't take screenshots without everybody's consent. Um, if you're teaching young learners, you would need their parents' consent to take screenshots. Um, but honestly, I can't think of a reason why you would ever need to do that. Okay. Um, you know, we should not be recording or taking screenshots. Um, and again, one more point on bullying and unsuitable. Oh, I'm missing a word there. Bullying and unsuitable behavior. Um, make it clear with your class that if anybody is trying to send them private messages or anyone is like teasing them in private chat, make sure they know to tell you about this. Okay, set down your ground rules and let the students know that it is absolutely unacceptable behavior. Okay. Um, once you start teaching, something you can do that will really benefit your students, like if you have the same group all the time, um, is to create a routine. Um, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you know, that is what we would do, right? We would always start with our warmer, um, we would always maybe do a vocabulary revision game from the last class or, you know, we would do a fun little speaking activity to start. Um, we would maybe at the end, we would do a recap, like a plenary session where they, you know, the students tell me what they learned. Um, again, we might do a little five minute game to finish. Um, so just as you would set a routine in a face to face classroom, you can also do that in an online classroom. Um, creating a routine helps students feel safe, it helps them feel included. Um, it makes things like giving instructions faster and easier because they know the sequence, you know, they know the rough sequence of the class. Um, so, as I said, things like doing a warmer, sharing your objectives with the class at the beginning so that they know what they're going to learn. Um, objectives or what we call a WALT, what are we going to learn today? Um, you know, that helps students know what is coming up and it helps them focus for the class. Um, you can end by setting homework and by having a nice summary or a plenary. Um, because, you know, sometimes when you're teaching online, your students can feel, you know, you see them on the screen, but they can feel quite far away. They can feel almost a bit passive. So by creating a routine and by them knowing what's going to happen, it can make them feel a lot more secure and participative. Um, something I really like about teaching online and something I find is much easier than teaching face to face is delivering instructions. Because when you're giving instructions, you will deliver them verbally as usual, but you can also pop them in the chat box so that if students haven't understood you, all they need to do is go to the chat box and read the instructions. Um, so, you know, you can, you can type as you speak and have your instructions for any given task in the chat box. Um, a nice idea is if um, you give instructions, you say to your students, um, has everybody understood or would you like me to repeat? And, you know, they can put either a thumbs up or they can put repeat please in the chat box. Um, as always, you should be asking your instruction checking questions. Yeah. So you might say, so can somebody type in the chat box exactly what we need to do just to make sure that they've understood. Or, you know, you can choose different students in your class to tell you the, to repeat the instructions back. Um, simultaneous feedback is a possibility here. So if they don't understand, they can tell you in real time, like, I don't know what we have to do, please explain again. Um, just as they would in a face-to-face -face classroom, I guess. Um, you can also use the chat box for things like sharing materials, links, etc. Um, the chat box is amazing, you know, so do use it, do make the most of it when you start teaching. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about classroom management and making sure that everybody is, 
is doing what they need to do and everyone is listening to you and each other. Um, the really good news is that managing a classroom in an online environment is easier to manage than physical classes. You know, you don't have people talking in the background, for example. And if they are, you can just mute them. <laughs> um, you know, there is no unnecessary distractions going on. Um, also, as I said, the chat box is really good here because any questions they have, they just type it instead of having to interrupt you or having to wait for you to get to them. Um, so there is nothing to fear from the classroom management side of things. Um, finally, let's say a brief word about student engagement. Um, as I said, when you're teaching online, even though you can see your students on the screen in front of you, there can be that sense of um, disconnect. Yeah. So it can sometimes be harder to engage your students on a screen um, than it would be in a face to face classroom. So my advice to you is to compensate for this by being, you know, a larger than life version of yourself. OK, that doesn't need, mean that you need to be all singing, all dancing, shouting, making faces, <laughs> you know, well, maybe if you're teaching young learners, you do need to be doing those things. But, you know, just go that extra mile to project your personality, you know, maybe put a bit of extra intonation into your voice, um, you know, reach them through the screen if you can. And for some of us, that will mean amping up our voice, our personality just a notch, OK, to compensate for the, the physical distance between us. Um, use the chat box, as I've said now, I think three times. Yeah. Keep checking on everybody, um, adding in extra information, etc. Um, you know, the chat box is your best friend, I think, in, when online teaching. Um, keep all of the students included, just as you would in a real life classroom. Um, so keep asking students for their input. You might randomize who you're calling on. You can find these really fun virtual spinners where you put your students' names, you click a button, it picks a student, um, it lands on a student's name, and then that student can answer your question. Um, little things like that keeps everybody on their toes. Um, finally, I would say, you know, while we are projecting our personalities and, you know, while we are using all these fun tools to grab our students' attention, also, don't be afraid to embrace the silence. You know, sometimes you may want to do a five minute worksheet in silence and that's fine. OK, sometimes students may need more time to process and come up with an answer when you ask them a question. Give them that time. OK, um, embrace the silence at times. It doesn't all need to be manic <laughs> um, entertainment all the time. All right, just like in a real, you know, in a physical classroom, we want to aim for variety. OK, so now it's your turn to hit the chat box that I've been talking about so much. Um, I'm sure you all have lots of questions related to teaching online, so please type them into the chat box. And while you do, I am going to see who's here and where you all are. Um, so, hello, Cathy in Cape Town, Lillian in Italy, Catherine in Belgium. Oh, wonderful country, beautiful food. <laughs> Paula in Dubai. Very good. Robbie in Devon. Oh, how beautiful. I'd love to visit. Okay, we have South Africa, Nigeria. Very nice. We have Mary in Ireland. Ah, where are you, Mary? Um, I'm in Galway, way over west west of Ireland and um, Florida. So hi, Tia. I hope you are doing OK after the horrible um, hurricane you had a few weeks ago. Hopefully you you emerged safely from it. Um, we have Italy, Brazil, South Africa. Oh, Debra, you completed the course. Yay. Go, Debra. Well done. That is some achievement. Very well done and best of luck. Okay, um, 
South Africa again, lovely. Um, so, Robbie, we have a question. Read GDPR, should we keep students' email addresses on some device other than our laptop, like an external hard drive or USB stick? Um, I do keep them on an external hard drive, Robbie, and I would tell my students that I will keep your information while you're a student and for six months after you have stopped being my student, just in case I need to communicate with you. And after that, I will wipe it. Um, so yeah, discuss it with your students and decide like how long you're going to keep it. Because ideally you should not be keeping it for much longer than you need it. Okay, um, but yeah, I do keep them on an external drive that's really easy for me to wipe as necessary. All right, thank you, Robbie. Good question. Okay. Um, so, hello, Kate. Can you recommend a good course book that has good resources for online teaching? Um, honestly, I don't know if there's a course book I would recommend because, you know, course books are all on paper. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily need that when we're online teaching. Um, so, actually, Kate, you've reminded me of something. If you're working for an online school, yeah, they will typically provide all of the material for you. So when you enter your classroom, you will have like all of the material loaded on slides. So that can be another big plus point of working for a school. Um, so they provide you with all of the materials. Um, if you were working as an independent, Kate, though, um, you know, there are a lot of really good online resources um, from websites such as Busy Teacher, dot org yeah or onestopenglish.com um you know you can do things like download pdfs and then you know screen share with your students um you can use lots of visuals like when i'm using zoom or microsoft teams or google meet i will tend to put things in a slideshow because it's then so easy to um, share your screen and you know share with your students, share the material with your students. Um, you can do things like create interactive worksheets um, and then share the link with your students. Um, as I mentioned before, Padlet, okay, you can create your own Padlet for the class and put all of your materials up there for your students to visit. Um, so yeah, when you're working as an independent, you have to do a lot of your own materials um, searching. Yeah, like Google will be your best friend. <laughs> um, but as I said, if you're working for an online school, they will provide all of this for you, which is pretty great. It's one of the biggest advantages, I think, of working for an online school. All right, thank you, Kate. Um, so, hello, Becca Louise. Do you, would you suggest we ensure students have cameras on or off, etc.? Um, Becca, I would always say on because it helps that engagement and you can see that they are listening, that they are engaged and that they are paying attention. Um, with webcams off, you know, they could be coming and going. They could be doing something else. They could be watching another screen in the meantime. They could have you on mute. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would always advise webcam on. Um, now, if there's some reason that your student, a student asks you if they can turn it off, I mean, that's up to you and your judgment. But yeah, I would certainly recommend keeping them on and keep your own on. It's important that they see you. All right. So hello, Paula. Um, do you tend to use physical teaching aids or is it better to use digital images such as Canva? Um, I think, Paul, it depends on what you're teaching. Like I had a class um, with young learners there a few years ago and it was just all about household objects. It was a vocabulary lesson. So like it was super easy for me to like gather together all my stuff and just like show them in front of the webcam. Like, oh, this is a remote control or this is a cup a saucepan. Um, so, you know, it can be easier to use an actual object if you can and just hold it up to the webcam. 
Um, but yeah, a lot of the time we will be using digital versions, like we'll be using slideshows or yeah, we can make worksheets on Canva to send them a link to. Um, so yeah, you can use a mixture of both. Um, or if you found like a really cool picture in a magazine that you want to show them and you have the actual picture, hold it up. Yeah, you know, it depends, whatever's easiest for you. But I think, yeah, we will tend to use more um, digital aids here. All right, nice question. Thank you, Paula. All right. So Lawrence, hello. Um, what equipment is needed for online teaching? Um, well, as a minimum, Lawrence, a laptop or a PC. Um, as a bonus, you might have a, a microphone or a headset, or if you wanted the, the headphone microphone um, combination headsets. Um, you might need things like Wi-Fi boosters. Um, if possible, you might connect to your to your router, your internet router with an Ethernet cable. Okay, that can often um, give you more stable connection than Wi-Fi. But you know, it depends on your setup. Um, for example, I don't use a headset because I'm pretty confident with my um, laptop speakers. Um, I'm pretty confident with my Wi-Fi, so I don't use an Ethernet cable. Um, I don't use a headset. But now I can hear my my three year old screaming upstairs. Maybe you can too. So perhaps I should have used a headset <laughs> to cancel out all of the inevitable noise that goes on in my house. Um, but yeah, as a minimum, Lawrence, your laptop or your PC, and all of the rest you can add in as needed. All right, good question. Um, so let me go back and see if I missed any questions because I ran through those pretty quickly. And, you know, we have loads of time left, so keep typing in those questions. Okay, I think we have addressed those questions. Okay. Um, so as a reminder, because we're talking about online teaching today, um, we are only going to answer questions about online teaching. Um, any other questions you have about any other aspect of TEFL, please send along a question to tutor support and we will be more than happy to help. Okay. So, get typing in those questions, guys. I know you have them. <laughs> whether it's questions about working for schools versus being independent or how to keep your learners engaged um, or how to do like listenings, readings, etc. I'm confident you have loads of questions. Okay, so Angelica, hello, um, from Spain. Oh, amazing. Um, I lived in Spain, Angelica, for like nearly 10 years. It's a beautiful country. Where in Spain are you? I wonder. Um, I love to know. <laughs> it brings back memories. Um, so what about lighting, background, natural, etc.? cetera? Um, yeah, Angelica, lighting will be really important. Um, I mean, I would always go natural if possible, but you know, depending on the time of year and time of day, that is not always possible. Um, for example, here, when the time changes, it's going to be like dark at four o'clock half four or five. Um, so I would say natural if possible. But after that, just, you know, go to your desk and check out lots of different lighting scenarios, you know, check it out with the overlight head, maybe that's or the overlight head, that's the wrong way around the overhead light. <laughs> um, you know, it may be perfect, it may be too shadowy. So you might try a desk lamp, um, you may have to angle it around. Um, trial and error, but always see what you look like in on screen in your lighting. Um, but yeah, I would do I would do natural if possible, but totally appreciate that that's not always possible, especially living in a living through a dark winter. 
All right, good. So thank you, Angelica. Oh, in Huelva. Oh, how beautiful. I love Huelva. The beaches are amazing. Um, I lived in Malaga for a long time and Cordoba. So I often visited Huelva and Cadiz and all of those beaches along there are amazing. So say hola to Spain for me. <laughs> okay. Um, Martin, which online payment systems are not popular and known to be problematic? Oh, gosh. Good question, Martin. Um, honestly, I'm not sure. I don't think that I've ever had a problematic one. Um, I know when I was working for an online school, they paid me direct to my bank account, which was never any problem. Um, in the last few years, I've been using Revolut, which is absolutely perfect. Um, but I've never heard of one that has been discouraged. Um, I know there's one at the moment called Wise that's getting pretty popular or Google Pay. Mm. But yeah, Martin, I've never heard of a problematic one, thankfully, which can only be a good thing, right? Like you could use PayPal. Um, but yeah, I've never heard of a problematic one. Hmm, thankfully. <laughs> so hopefully you won't encounter any problems. Okay, and Esther, I see you had the same question, online payments. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, PayPal is super popular. Um, Revolut is very popular these days. Um, you might decide to be paid straight into your bank account, which is absolutely fine. Um, you know, it's just a matter of doing your research and finding a method that you feel comfortable with and then the students will figure it out, okay? Um, so yeah, do your research and decide which one you want to use. All right. Okay, so Paula, typically how long number of weeks would an online commitment to a student last? Uh, Paula, I know this is a really annoying answer, but it totally depends. Like it depends on what the student wants and needs. Like um, I have had students for just one session, you know, who have wanted to go over a particular grammar point maybe, or wanted to talk about a certain topic in preparation for a meeting or something. So like I have literally had students for one hour and I have had students for three years. <laughs> um, so it totally depends on what they want. Um, you will get anything and everything. Um, this has reminded me though, Paula, so thank you. Um, it's reminded me that if you are working as an independent, you will have to come up with some sort of cancellations policy um, because, you know, you don't want to be in the position where you are ready to go, ready to teach a lesson. The student cancels last minute and then you are left with, you know, no income for that hour. Um, so you've got to be very, very clear on your cancellation policy. And if possible, try to get your students to pay in advance. Okay, so you might let them, for example, book five lessons or, you know, pay today for the lesson that they're going to have tomorrow. Um, because that way you can say, like, if you cancel with less than 24 hours, um, you will still be charged for the class um, because they have essentially blocked your time. Okay, and if they cancel last minute, you don't have time to get somebody else. Um, so yeah, think carefully about that. Um, have a cancellations policy and make sure your students know about it so that there are no excuses. Um, if you encounter a student um, who doesn't pay you for the class, like if you are teaching first and getting payment after, and you have a student who does that maybe twice, who doesn't pay you for a lesson, finish up with that student, okay? We do not want reliable or we do not want unreliable payers, okay? Um, that is why I like arranging for payment in advance. Um, I will sometimes even offer a discount. Like I will say, you know, if you pay for five classes in advance, I'll give you a 10% discount on my rate. Um, so yeah, that is definitely something to talk about. Um, okay, so thank you, Paula. Good question. And thank you for reminding me of the cancellations policy. Okay, and Tia, what opportunities exist for teaching business online? Um, 
a lot of opportunities to you. It's an area that a lot of students are interested in. Um, there is our jobs board. Like if you go along to the tefalacademy.com jobs board, you will see there are ads looking specifically for business English teachers. Or if you go to another really good jobs website called tefl.com, they have an online job section and you will often find ads for business English um, teachers there too. Um, you know, it's a massive part of the industry. Um, if you are working as an independent, and you do want to teach business English, make sure you market yourself as a business English teacher. Okay, um, make that very clear and students will find you. Um, but yeah, big demand. Okay, Lawrence, which online platform would you recommend for teaching and why? Um, so Lawrence, I am a Zoom girl. <laughs> if I have the choice, I will always go for Zoom. Um, it's very easy to use, easy to navigate, easy to set up classes. Um, I am a fan of Zoom. Okay, but, you know, I am also very happy with Google Meet or Microsoft Teams. Okay, um, but again, that's just me. Try them out and see which one you like the best. Um, and again, if you decide to work for an online school, they will have their own platform that you will use. All right. Okay, Esther, do we sign a type of contract with the student? Um, you certainly can, Esther, like you can draw up a contract. Um, I have, well, basically my contract is just my cancellations policy. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have any more in there than that. Um, but, you know, you can absolutely put together your expectations and get your students to, to sign and return a copy to you, for sure. Um, yeah, just make sure that before you start teaching, you have covered payment, method of payment, um, cancellation policy, okay? Um, so thank you, Esther. Okay, so Monica, would you organize a sort of course like 12 lessons with a list of lesson contents? Um, well, if you are working for an online school, Monica, they will give you the content. You won't need to organize anything. Um, but if you are working as an independent, I would say before you do anything, meet your student and let them tell you what they need. Because once you know what they need, then you can absolutely put together a course. Okay, but take guidance from the student and their needs. Yeah, because ultimately, you know, you want to give them what they want. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely after knowing what they want, you can plan your course that meets their needs. Um, if you have a student who says, oh, I don't know what I want to do, just general English, um, then of course you can choose the topics that you think would be most useful. Um, so yeah, you might put together 12 lessons with a list of lesson contents in that case. Uh, but yeah, be guided by your student as much as possible. All right, so Catherine, during online courses in Google Classroom that I took, we often went through everyone's worksheets together so that we could learn to find our own mistakes. Would you say that's a good idea or not? Um, yeah, Catherine, I mean, I'm not opposed to it at all. Um, I can see why it would be useful. Um, I guess it could depend on your students and your group dynamic. Like some students don't mind that at all. Like I wouldn't mind people seeing my mistakes because, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not bothered by making mistakes. I know that's such a part of learning languages. Um, but, you know, some people might be a bit more um, hesitant for others to see their mistakes. Um, so I would say, Catherine, do it. But if you notice that the class aren't happy with it, perhaps consider doing another thing. Okay, good question. Thank you. Um, so, Kathy, hello. Are we paid via the school for lessons or are students liable? How does it work? Um, so if you are working for an online school, Kathy, um, you tell them what hours you want to work. Um, they will log your hours or... Sometimes you will have to send them like a weekly invoice with your hours 
and then the school will pay you directly into your bank account or whatever payment method you have decided on. Um, so yeah, working for a school, it'll be all done by bank transfer every week, every two weeks or every month, depending on how they operate their payments. Um, if you're independent, your student will pay you. Again, they'll pay you directly depending on the payment method you have established. All right. Um, so Lawrence, hello. How much can an online teacher charge a student for teaching English? Um, Lawrence, I think this, this depends on the part of the world you're based in and what the typical rate is. Um, for example, in Ireland, I would charge a lot more um, than I would in Spain, for example. Um, because, you know, the, the wages, the cost of living, everything is higher in Ireland. Um, it's a little lower in Spain. So, you know, you don't want to price yourself out of the market, but similarly, you do not want to over, or you do not want to undersell yourself. You know, please don't be tempted to charge something ridiculous like $5 an hour. <laughs> okay, that is just not enough. Um, so do your research, find the going rate for whatever part of the world you're in, and, you know, maybe add on a little bit to that so that you're not underselling yourself too much. And yeah, go from there. You know, you will know if you're pricing too high because you probably won't get as many students. So, you know, it can be a bit of trial and error um, before you find your perfect rate. But yeah, don't undersell yourself. Don't go too cheap because, you know, your time, your qualification, it's worth money. So make sure you're making enough to make a living. All right. And let's see one more question, Catherine. The most important question about this is that students can see each other's email addresses when they work together on one worksheet. So I'm worried about that. Ah, I get you. Okay, yeah. So the whole data protection thing. Um, in that case, Catherine, I think what you should do is maybe ask your students, you know, individually if they're comfortable with that. And if anybody says that they aren't, don't do it. Okay, like you could maybe private message each one of them or you could email them individually or whatever. Ask them if they're comfortable with it. And if not, scrap the idea. Um, if they say that they are okay with it, go ahead, but let them know that if at any stage they're not, you won't do it. Okay, good question, Catherine. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, so yeah, get consent for sure. Okay, um, Joyce, oh, you are so welcome. I'm glad it was useful. Um, it can be such an unknown world of teaching online. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully um, I've been able to shed some light on it. Um, thank you, Joyce. Okay. And okay, guys, we have one more minute. Oof, this has gone by so quickly. Um, you are welcome, Catherine. Um, so let's just do one more question. And if I haven't gotten round to your questions, please just send a ticket to Tutor Support. And we will be more than happy to answer all of your online teaching questions or indeed your questions about anything TEFL related. OK, send them along to Tutor Support. Um, OK, final question. Monica, would you ask to be paid a number of lessons in advance? How many? Um, so, yes, as I think I said before, Monica, I always request payment in advance now. OK, it depends on the student. Yeah, I will ask them, like, is it possible to pay five lessons in advance? And if it is, I will give you a 10 percent discount or a 5 percent discount. Um, the student might say, no, I can only pay one class in advance. And that's fine, too. I mean, I don't care how many lessons they book in advance as long as they are paying me beforehand because of my aforementioned cancellation policy. Um, that if they cancel less than 24 hours before the lesson, I will still charge them because they have effectively blocked me from earning any more money in that hour. Um, so, yeah. It's up to you. You know, you can set whatever you want. Maybe you want 10 in advance. Maybe you want five. 
maybe you will be guided by the student. It's up to you. Um, working as an independent, that's the joy of it. You set your own rules. Um, all right, good. So everyone, our time is up. Um, I do see that there are a couple of questions I haven't answered and I'm really sorry, uh, but again, send your ticket to, to tutor support. As always, this webinar will be published on either Monday or Tuesday. So if you have any questions about anything I said, you can go back and rewatch it on our YouTube channel. Um, pre and all of our previous webinars are there as well. Okay, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, as always, we are grateful for all and any feedback that you may have. Okay, all of your feedback helps us to keep improving and to keep giving you topics you are interested in. So if you can find just two more minutes of your Saturday, um, please head along to this website and complete a two minute survey. Okay, it's very, very quick and very helpful for us. Um, you can scan the QR code or you can follow the link that I am about to put in the chat box. Okay, such a long link. There we go. Okay, so you can also click on the link in the chat box. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming along, everyone. Um, I wish you all the luck in the world um, with the rest of your TEFL course and for your future online teaching careers. Um, now, go enjoy the rest of your weekend and hopefully I will see you all again soon. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>